Mizzou football has proven it can play with anybody, but much like the LSU game, just a few too many mistakes against Georgia to pull it out at the end. Plus, it wouldn't be a heartbreaking Missouri loss without some bizarre officiating. So let's talk about all that and more coming up right now on Locked on Mizzou. You are Locked on Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, all you truth and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso and the central scrutinizer of Missouri Tigers football and basketball and just as a quick reminder this show is brought to you by game time download the game time app create an account and use code locked on college for twenty dollars off your first purchase and as i said at the halftime of this ball game over at x.com when it was 10 to 10 at halftime that was not a fluke whatsoever. Obviously, Georgia was the superior team yesterday, ended up deserving that victory, in my humble opinion. But Missouri ran the ball down Georgia's throat yesterday and also put, I thought, Carson back, the Georgia quarterback, under more pressure than he's been all season. Other than maybe the Auburn game, that was the toughest game of the season for Georgia. Certainly their toughest game at home by far, where hardly anybody other than, well, Lee Corso on college game day gave Missouri much of a shot. But after the game, Kirby Smart on Missouri's success running the football he said it was a lot about tempo. They didn't do anything that they didn't do all year. They didn't scheme us up. They whipped our ass. That's what Kirby Smart said. And I totally agree with his analysis. If you've watched Missouri all season, as I'm sure you have listening to this program, yeah, we've seen outside zone from Missouri all season. Also, outside zones to the short side of the field, as I've been pointing out time and time again this year. Now, honestly, on that short side thing, at this point, I've accepted that there's something that I don't see that the Missouri coaching staff sees. Now, as far as running a bunch of outside zone, I understand the logic of those outside zone stretch plays. Yeah, that's going to wear out a defense over time. And it certainly seems like the second half, that's not a fluke either. The trend of really good running from Missouri in the second half. There's something in this scheme beyond just, hey, wearing guys out. M Missouri has really figured this out, especially Cody Schrader has figured out how to run behind his blockers. And man, those blockers have just done such a great job of keeping Cook clean, but also opening up running holes, especially compared to last season. There's no doubt about that. Again, I'd actually love to somebody to ask the Missouri coaching staff they're probably not going to give us an answer, but I'd be curious anyway. What is it about running to the short side of the field? Because Missouri, at least at least one time, even after a kickoff, decided to spot the ball, again, on the right side, the right hash, short side of the field, if you will. Again, that's kind of against what you would think a right-handed quarterback would like to do if he wants to roll out, for instance. But again, there's got to be something that the Missouri coaching staff sees that I don't because they deserve a tremendous amount of credit in this ball game. The total yards, the yards per play, whatever way you want to look at it as far as those stats go, the game was basically even. Georgia got into the red zone two more times and Missouri lost the turnover battle two to nothing. Statistically, that was clearly the difference in the ball game, and it also committed three more penalties, which some of which were indeed rather questionable. We're going to get to the refs a little bit later, but honestly, that's been this team a little bit so far this year, hasn't it? Quite talented on both sides of the ball. We've got some real playmakers, some real NFL type players for sure on offense and defense. This team is capable of great things. But we also have a tendency to shoot ourselves in the foot a few times in the game. And Georgia really doesn't. Let's be honest. And if Kirby Smart does not get enough credit as a head coach, as Eli Drinkwitz suggested this week, 
Well, frankly, I think that's why. Kirby's been able to get a bunch of five-star and four-star players from high school who, make no mistake about it, each and every one of those guys thinks that they are the star of the team when they walk onto campus, or they're going to be pretty soon. So to get all of those types of personality to buy into their program, get on the same page, all that good stuff, hey, discipline, all that boring nonsense that most of the time, you know, 18-year-old studs don't really want to necessarily hear that much about. The fact that he's been able to make that the standard for his program is obviously really impressive. And here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that Missouri lacks discipline as a program. I'm just saying that the Tigers aren't quite on that level yet of the of the two-time national champions, right? A team that's undefeated so far this season over two-thirds of the way through. Maybe that's an obvious statement, but really the point here is that, by golly, Missouri is not that far off from that level either. I think that's what, what this game told us yesterday, most importantly. But, Nate, but make no mistake about it. This is not a moral victory for Missouri. This is simply a loss. And you know what? While that hurts, that's actually a good thing. Missouri should be past moral victories at this point. And clearly, based on what I heard from Eli Drinkwitz post game, a lot of guys who were bummed out after the game, who were hurt, disappointed, really, really disappointed that we did not pull out a victory against Georgia, keeping our hopes for the SEC East title. The SEC title, the college football playoff, everything was still alive. You win that game for Missouri. So I'm glad that the guys in that locker room are mad and angry, maybe even some tears in their eyes. I understand that. I really do. That's a good thing. Let it hurt. Let this drive you. Let this focus you for the rest of the season against Tennessee and Florida because I'm telling you right now, a 10-win season at the University of Missouri, that's a heck of a thing to celebrate. It's a heck of a thing to celebrate at any college football program. So Missouri still has a ton to look forward to. And by the way, so many guys from this team are going to be on the team in 2024. That 24 team has everything to play for and should have a similar look to this year's ball club. Obviously, some key players will be gone. Some key players will be back. I just think overall the direction of this program is pretty clear right now. And while I've given the Tigers a lot of credit here for yesterday's loss, well, we got to pick some nits to maybe use the benefit of hindsight to say what I would have liked to have seen a little bit different in the second half for sure. Also, we got to talk about the rather bizarre officiating at times. Had a friend who said it felt like a game in Allen Fieldhouse, and which amused me, I got to say. But you know what? I don't want to ever go to Allen Fieldhouse. I don't know about you, but here's where I want to go. I want to go to Mizzou Arena. And when you do this Monday, if you're looking to go to the home opener for the Tigers, you got to check out game time because it's the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater you can possibly want. And it really is the easiest and best way to find great deals on tickets, especially at the last minute. You can get into the Arkansas Pine Bluff game for 6 bucks right now. $27, the cheapest ticket for Memphis. So looking like a good crowd there for a Friday night game. Let's fill up Mizzou Arena. How about that? But also, you got to download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N. C-O-L-L-E-G-E for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets. Lowest price guaranteed. Now, obviously, let's talk about the elephant in the room here at the top. At the top. Let's talk about Brady Cook's two interceptions. Number one, the pass, the screen pass that was picked off there by Georgia interior lineman that's just a ball that can't be thrown you know the big boy's right in his face he just can't throw that ball I think we can all agree with that I would also say that on the final interception of the game not nearly 
as egregious there for Brady Cook, but at the same time, that pass was on third down and 10. Missouri did not have to be quite that desperate at that point, in my opinion. But still, obviously, some good moments from Brady Cook in this game, including that deep shot to Luther Burden for a touchdown there in the first quarter. And obviously, Burden being hobbled there later in the game, I thought really hurt Missouri's offense. Obviously, as the game, the clock kind of was starting to wind down there. The Tigers were pretty content to seemingly throw nothing but back shoulder fades to Theo Weiss as the clock started winding there. <laughs> as apparently, it was even more successful when Brady Cook was surprised by the snap as he was on 4th and 13 there. That was a bit of a comical completion there for a first down. But anyway, Georgia definitely did make some adjustments there. I thought Aaron Taylor who was on the call yesterday, was one of the more generic and annoying people I've ever heard in my entire life. But I did think he was correct that clearly Georgia adjusted defensively as the game went along, played less man-to-man, -man, more zone, put a spy on Brady Cook on occasion, and definitely limited his legs, which had really hurt Georgia there in the first half. And again, with those, with Brady Cook's legs more or less taken out of the game and Luther Burden clearly not 100% there as the game was wearing on, it just seemed like the Missouri offense was having trouble getting anything going in the passing game. So in hindsight, though, obviously in the second half, while the passing game was struggling, the running game was thriving, and Missouri was just getting chunks and chunks and chunks of yards. So to me, in hindsight, Boy, I would really like to have seen it just be the old run, 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 and play action deep shot kind of offense, which a lot of defenders, by the way, for all the new you know RPO stuff and read options and all this stuff, a lot of the smartest defenders in football at the NFL level, what I've always heard them say is actually the hardest defense to defend if you can actually execute it is that type of offense. The type of offense that can run it at you and that is just going to take deep shots. That's the hardest thing you can defend. Well, I think that's kind of what Missouri should have run in the second half. Would have liked to have seen Marquise Johnson get a target or two, especially since Missouri was doing a fairly good job, I thought, of keeping Cook clean on those play action looks. Would have liked to have seen more than that. Georgia certainly had some good gains on those plays in the second half, but you know what? Missouri defensively also, I would say, played mostly man-to-man -man as we would have expected, but not quite as tight a coverage. It wasn't the bump and run, really aggressive man defense that we saw, which I think kind of surprised Carson Beck and maybe confused him a little bit at times. But, you know, I, I thought the defense for the most part did its job. Just the offense couldn't quite get enough done there in the second half and really in the first half after that big uh, touchdown uh, to Luther Burden. Now, I mentioned Marquise Johnson there a, a little bit ago. He did obviously have a really big mistake on special teams, and really this was the only special teams moment that ended up costing Missouri. It was a play where, if you remember the play, he catches the ball over his head, sh should have been a fair catch, ends up getting tackled inside the Missouri five-yard line, actually at the three-yard line here according to the game recap on ESPN. But Missouri was able to run out of that really deep position there. So I think maybe a lot of Missouri fans have forgotten this sequence, that mistake there by Marquise Johnson. But as you can see here, this, this kickoff came after Georgia's first touchdown, or actually I should say it's first touchdown in the third quarter. Then Missouri starts deep in its own territory Runs by eight yards, five yards by Schrader, an incomplete pass. Seven-yard run by Schrader makes it third and three. Well, you'd like to think maybe Missouri would run it again. They do not, and a Brady Cook incomplete pass. Now it's fourth down and three from the Missouri 20. Obviously, that's a punting situation. But the point here is if Marquise Johnson simply waves for a fair catch, Missouri gets the ball at the 25. That's 22 yards of field position. So if Missouri has it fourth and three from its own 45, does Missouri potentially think about going for it there 
in a game in which obviously they're significant underdogs. You've got everything to play for a team. There hasn't been a, a number one team that has lost at home in practically a decade. So that's the type of odds that are against you. I think maybe Missouri does roll the dice in that situation. But even more importantly, let's say Missouri punts. If they're able to pin Georgia back inside its own 10 or something like that, well, perhaps they don't get the next touchdown that they get. Again, this Marquise Johnson play, this was basically the meat to the bread of the two third quarter touchdowns by the dogs. That was just a massive moment in the game, a huge mistake by a true freshman. So listen, I forgive him. Don't get me wrong. I'm not putting the game on his head or anything like that. My point is when you're playing a team like Georgia, those little moments can just be gigantic ones. And I think that really was those hidden sort of special teams, yards there, that field position. I think that ended up costing Missouri a touchdown on the back end there defensively. And you know what? Finally, after all this time, we do have to address the officiating, which it really did feel like an Allen Fieldhouse type of basketball game on the football field in that it doesn't matter how well you play. It just feels like the referees are against you. Okay, it wasn't quite as bad as Allen Fieldhouse. I just saw somebody make that comparison and thought it was amusing. But I will say at the very least, there's a couple of really inconsistent rules, in my opinion, that should just be gotten rid of in college football. And I thought the offensive pass interference that got taken away by instant replay yesterday was a perfect example of what I'm going to talk about here uh, coming up here in just a second. But first, I do want to tell you about prize picks, which is the easiest way to play daily fantasy sports. And not only is it easy to me it's one of the best and and most logical ways to play it too and here's what I'm talking about anytime over at over at prize picks you pick two to six players they can even be on the same team by the way so this is why it's logical maybe you don't know a lot about the Miami Dolphins but you know the Kansas City Chiefs all you have to do is take Patrick Mahomes more than 24 and a half rushing yards, for instance, and take Isaiah Pacheco perhaps less than 55 and a half rushing yards. If you think Mahomes is actually going to be the guy who gets the, the yards on the ground against the Dolphins. But regardless of what you think, you got to go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college and use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash locked on college and use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy. So the point I'm about to make here about offensive pass interference and linemen downfield in particular is not sour grapes based on yesterday. This is something I've been talking about on this program for a long time because in college football, unlike the NFL, you can, as an offensive lineman, you can be as far downfield as you want to be as long as the pass is completed or apparently incompleted behind the line of scrimmage. I've all, I, I just hate that rule, quite honestly. I just think it makes it way too hard to play to defend those screen passes and swing passes, that type of deal. I just think it's unfair, quite honestly. I really do, especially in a world of run pass options and that kind of thing. It, it's hard enough to play defense in modern college football. I would just like to see that rule gotten rid of. But it's also... Another reason I, I'd like to see it getting rid of is how wildly inconsistent it is. Think about think about the logic of overturning that pass interference play by instant replay. And by the way, a bunch of people legitimately were going, now wait a second, since when can you review a pass interference play? Well, evidently you can review if the ball got to the line of scrimmage or not. See, what's bizarre here is that unlike intentional grounding, where if you're trying to get rid of the football and it doesn't get to the line of scrimmage and you're still in the pocket, well, you're punished for that. But apparently on offensive pass interference, it's the exact opposite. When the lineman is downfield, it's a pick play, whatever it might be, like, oh, okay, so Carson Beck 
was too weak noodled armed on that play to get it an extra seven inches so therefore that's not a 15 yard penalty again that's the exact opposite flipped around from how from how an intentional grounding play is called how does that make any logical sense whatsoever honestly it does not so maybe the officials ruled that correctly I've never really seen a, a play overturned like that. I'm sure somebody out there can show me an example. But to me, that's just a terrible rule that, oh, well, we're just going to bail you out of this because you you just so happen to not have thrown the ball far enough. To me, that's what we're going to review now. Just get rid of that whole rule. Offensive lineman, guess what? You don't get to get 5 to 20 yards downfield on a passing play. You just don't. you got to be within a, a yard of the line of scrimmage. How about that? Is that the craziest thing I've ever heard? Well, a few weeks ago, the craziest thing I had ever heard in the Missouri against LSU game was, of course, the disconcerting signals call. Now, that's just a hilarious way of, of describing that particular infraction, number one. But I did my whole jag about the clap a while ago, made my stupid, my, my stupid STG joke, of course. But no, really, when it comes to the clap, when the quarterback, Missouri does this, LSU did it, I, just about everybody in college, I didn't notice if Georgia did the clap yesterday or not off the top of my head. But the point is, even lots of NFL teams do it these days. Instead of saying hike or blue 32 or whatever the heck it might be, they clap and then they get the football. That's when they know that they're ready to go. Well, to me... The whole thing of, oh, well, the defensive guy clapped too, so we're going to throw a penalty. I, I I just, what are we doing here? Why do we have to protect the clap, something that's been around for about four and a half years or something? I don't know, for the entire history of football, including the greats like Patrick Mahomes and Peyton Manning and, and Johnny Unitas and, and Sonny Jernigan and just go back forever. They all, Sid Luckman, I'm just trying to think of really old, quarterbacks right now but the point is they were all able to use their voice and guess what your voice is a lot more distinctive to other people's voices than clapping your hands turns out all of our claps sound very similar so you know what if you're going to use the clap that's on you that's part of the risk I'm sorry I don't need yet another stupid rule for the officials to be concerned about I want them to be paying attention to the line of scrimmage I want them to be paying attention to holding penalties and guys who jump off sides I don't care if like oh well who clapped there was it the quarterback or was it the middle linebacker just get rid of that rule if, if that means guys have to get rid of the clap well who freaking cares for 150 years of football Guys have gotten away with just saying, hud, hud, hike. What an incredible thought. But again, one more call that really bothered me, obviously. The defensive pass interference called on Drayden Norwood when the ball was thrown well, well behind the Georgia receiver. I'm sure some Georgia fans will be saying, oh, well, he had his hand on his hip. I'm sorry, that's, that's a bit of an ignorant statement. And I mean that in a literal sense, ignorant, and then you don't know how pass interference is actually called in 2023 because you can put your hand on the guy's back, his hip, his shoulder, his backside, his inner thigh, whatever it might be, as long as you don't use that, grab the jersey or grab a part of his body and, and pull the guy around, that's fine. And again, when is the last time you saw a ball be called uncatchable in college football? I, I don't think I've seen it happen once in this season. So again, it just seemed like all the 50-50 calls for the most part were going Georgia's way. And I'm not going to sit here and cry about that. Actually, I'm going to use it to make a point because it's not as though Georgia fans can say, well, it was fluky. No, Missouri lost the turnover battle. We committed most of the penalties we shot ourselves in the foot and Missouri gave I think Georgia everything it wanted and congratulations to the dogs on yet another victory they certainly earned it but you know what for as disappointed as I am this morning I'm still holding my head high because this team made me proud in a lot of ways again no moral victories whatsoever they're gonna let it hurt for a while as they should because again this Missouri program is beyond moral victories 
moral victories are not for winners. And I think that's what this team is here in 2023. And I think there's going to be more victories to come here as the rest of the season unfolds. So thanks as always for joining me here on Locked on Mizzou. Thanks for making this show your first listen every day. And thanks for telling another true son or daughter about the program. We're of course free and available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube and ad free on Amazon music as well. So until next time, I'm John Miller and this has been locked on Mizzou.